Hey there, and welcome to another video on Corpus Linguistics. Today we'll look at a question that may seem a little strange at first, namely this one here. Is it the egg and the chicken, or the chicken and the egg? And I'm not asking you which one came first, except yes, I do. Yeah, so do you prefer to say the egg and the chicken, where the egg comes first, or do you think it sounds better if I say the chicken and the egg, where the chicken comes first? So, linguists call these expressions binomials or binomial expressions because there are two nouns in the egg and the chicken and they are put in a certain order and speakers can choose whether they want to put the egg first or whether they want to put the chicken first. Now, obviously, there are certain factors that guide speakers' behavior yeah? and we're going to explore these factors with the help of corpus data. Okay, so if you want to do a little exercise, get out a piece of paper and a pen, and I will show you a couple of binomial expressions, and I'll ask you which order you actually prefer. Okay, if you want to do that, pause the video here. Otherwise, we have binomials coming up in three, two, one. Here we go. Do you prefer to say health and safety or safety and health? What about training and education or education and training? Mom and dad or dad and mom? And finally, industry and trade or trade and industry? Okay, let's maybe go through them one by one. Um, here, I'm willing to bet money that you picked health and safety, yeah? <clears throat> I would choose education and training. <clears throat> Mom and dad, I mean, come on. <laughs> and here, uh, I'm not sure, but I would say trade and industry. Okay, so here we have some frequencies from the B and C. And on the left-hand side, we have combinations that are preferred, that are a lot more frequent then their corresponding combinations on the right hand side. So we have men and women, uh, which occurs a lot more frequently than women and men. Health and safety, that's one from our list. Uh, trade and industry, oh yeah, so I picked the right one. Um, research and development, yeah, look at that asymmetry, 700 research and development, and then just four development and research. Uh, goods and services, science and technology, Mr. and Mrs., law and order. Uh, so for law and order, there's actually zero examples of order and law in the BNC. Mom and dad, yeah, that's no surprise. And then we have education and training, which is a lot more frequent than training and education. Okay, so at this point, I hope to have convinced you that there is a kind of phenomenon there. Okay, so some orders are just much more frequent than others. Speakers have a preference for one order rather than the other. And now we could say, well, okay, that's coincidence. Yeah, one order gets conventionalized and then it becomes much more frequent and speakers are a little bit hesitant to use the other order. But I think there's more to it. And I want you to think about this for a couple of minutes, okay? So here are a few questions that we'll deal with in this video. So the overarching question, if you like, is uh, why are there these asymmetries in frequency? Why do speakers say men and women so much more often than women and men? <clears throat> I mean, I could think of an explanation, yeah? Um, what about science and technology? Yeah. Is there also an explanation why science would um, should come first and technology would come second? And is that the same explanation that we have in men and women? Um, yeah, think about this for a moment. And I'd like you to identify three different factors that could explain why there are these preferences. So try to identify three different factors that could play a role. And once you have identified those factors, think about which ones are more important than others. So rank the relative importance of these factors that you've come up with. Okay, I'll let you do that now and I will continue. 
Now, English binomials uh, have attracted a lot of attention and there is a good chunk of work out there uh, that has dealt with these factors. So one factor that I'm guessing is on your list is frequency. So when you have two items and you order them, there's a good chance that the higher frequency item comes first. So in a combination like language and linguistics, I mean, I love linguistics, but language is just so much more frequent than linguistics. Another factor that I think jumped out at you is the length of the word. So usually the shorter item comes first. So we have fruit and vegetables, uh, food and beverages, science and technology, and so on and so forth. So that is a very powerful factor and we'll look at it in more detail later in this video. Uh, importance, that's another uh, factor. So name and address, you could argue that, well, the name is much more important than the address. There could be more people living at the same address, so you really need the name. Um, temporal sequence, or um, what you could call iconicity of sequence. So you name the first thing first, and then the second thing that happened later, you name a uh, second. So cause and effect would be something like that. You could argue the same for day and night, okay? So first the day, then the night, and yeah, I know, uh, <laughs> that's sort of a shaky argument there. Uh, but anyway, when we have clear temporal sequence, then uh, we might see that in the combinations and their frequencies. And the last factor that I have on here is animacy. So animals are alive, plants are sort of alive, and um, well, so we have combinations like animals and plants rather than plants and animals. All of these are, um, well, <clears throat> either semantic or language external factors of so frequency, for example. There are a couple of language internal factors that I haven't put on this slide. So for example, uh, the phonological characteristics of the items, stress pattern, what kind of phoneme comes first and last, uh, what vowels are included in the words. All of these have been shown to play a role and I might get into that later in this video. Okay, now uh, let's get back to the factors that you identified that you were thinking of and to your ranking of those factors. On the slide, you see word pairs in no particular order, and I want you to apply your factors to produce an order that you think would be preferred, right? So for example, if you said length is the decisive factor, then uh, you would look at bacon and eggs and see that eggs has one syllable and bacon has two. So, well, that would predict eggs and bacon. For labor and business, well, uh, both have two syllables, so length doesn't really make a prediction, yeah? but maybe some of your other factors do. So if you uh, look at the frequencies, for instance, what's more frequent, business or labor? Probably business, so you would say business and labor. Okay, for books and articles, again, if you take the length argument, then uh, it should be books and articles. If you take the frequency argument, it should also be books and articles. And um, you might even say that books are more substantial, more important. And so all of these three factors would align to give you books and articles rather than articles and books. Okay, so I would like you to do that little exercise and come up with a preferred order, an order that you think should be more frequent in corpus data for all of these combinations. Okay, I'm going to continue with the actual results here. So we see bacon and eggs is preferred to eggs and bacon. Business and labor is preferred to labor and business. Books and articles, language and linguistics, face and neck. Yeah, so the face is kind of more important than the neck. Both have the same length. Uh, face is surely more frequent than neck. Power and sun and air, uh, power and authority, pen and paper, fruit and vegetable, heat and power, heart and soul, books and papers, and physics and chemistry. 
So I hope that you got at least some of them right. And I also hope that you got at least some of them wrong because that means that there are some factors at work that we still need to figure out. And that's what we're going to do in the rest of this video. So what we're going to do is this. We will use antconc to retrieve data on English binomial expressions. We will import that data into Excel or any other spreadsheet software that you have lying around. We will annotate the data for preference of order, fixedness, and for factors that influence the order of binomial expressions. And most importantly, of course, we'll try to figure out which factors matter the most. All right, so let's go. Let's collect some data. Okay, do me a favor and open AntConc and navigate to the BNC A files and load those files into the concordance program. If you want to use any other corpus, that's fine too. It'll give you similar results. And um, as always, you can download the concordances from this video from the description below. Right, so here's the AntConc interface once we have loaded the corpus files into the program. And now we need to work with the global settings and in particular the token definition. This is a tip that I got from Yasine Yabdwana. Um, I hope I'm not butchering your name. Um, thanks for the tip. Yeah, and you should check out his YouTube channel. He has a bunch of uh, tutorials on corpus related stuff. So you should really check it out. Link in the description below. So what we need to do is that we need to go to the global settings in AntConc and we need to work with this field here uh, which says user defined token class and we need to activate this checkbox use following definition and in the default there will be all lowercase and uppercase letters in that field and we need to add three uh, characters or non-characters actually. We need to add a white space, we need to add the open, well the, the smaller sign, and we need to add the larger sign. Okay, so three signs that we need to add and then hit apply and that will make our life much easier when we're working with the search terms in our concordances. Okay, so be sure to do this step, otherwise you'll run into trouble later. Right, so here we have a first regular expression that will catch <clears throat> uh, a binomial expression with two nouns without any determiners. Okay, there are other binomials that have determiners, the fast and the furious, and so on and so forth. There are expressions with coordinated adjectives, and so on and so forth. So all we're doing in this video is look at uh, bare nouns, so to speak. Yeah. So abilities and achievements, or abilities and limitations, ability and aptitude, and so on and so forth. And the regular expression that we have here gives us just that, okay? So a first noun, and I put a full stop here so that we catch both uh, singular nouns, NN1, and plural nouns, NN2. Um, after the tag, lowercase letters, more than one of them, a white space, and then the conjunction AND, and basically the same thing as before, yeah? So a noun tag with uh, the option of either nn1 or nn2 and again lowercase letters. Right, as you see I got quite a few hits for this. Uh, so in our corpus which has 12 million words about 22,000 uh, well 22,800 hits. You notice that I activated the regex checkbox here so that's something that you will need to do as well. Sorting, it doesn't matter which way you set this up <clears throat> but if you set it to first right, second right, third right, you will see your results show up in the same way that uh, you see them here. Now, remember our little trick with the user-defined token class. This allows us to do something very clever. Namely, you notice that I set the search window size to zero. Okay, And all of this is uh, treated by AntConc as one token, so to speak. So this means that when we save this, we don't have to delete stuff to the right and left, okay? We're 
uh, getting rid of that extra work. We can just download this and we just have the center cut of what we really would like to work with. So thanks again, Yasin, for, for that tip. Okay, so once we have this, we need to save the concordance and you can pick a name such as binomials or anything that appeals to you. And uh, we can copy and paste our results into Excel and make headers. So in this case, there should be the token number, then the results and your recognizabilities and limitations and so on and so forth, and the corpus files. <clears throat> and I've added the, the header, so they won't show up automatically. Maybe you will also have empty columns to the left and right. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, just get rid of whatever you don't need. And uh, as long as you have this middle file with the binomials, you're actually fine. Okay, once we have that, we need to make, you guessed it, another pivot table. So under data, you can click synthesize with, with a pivot table and what you get is a long frequency list, if you like, of the different binomials that we have in our data. And um, well, fair warning, we have about 23,000 tokens and these um, distribute over about 17,000 different types. Okay, so many different uh, lines here. <clears throat> and we're only going to be working with the most frequent ones. So here I've pasted them into a new sheet and I've ordered them in decreasing after decreasing frequency. So the most frequent combination is men and women. Then we have policemen and women. That's a well that, that, that's an artifact of the composition of the corpus that we have here. Law and order, research and development, salt and pepper, life and death, and so on and so forth. So if you've gotten to this step, uh, congratulations, we're already quite far. <clears throat> and then, uh, as I said, we're only going to be working with a small subset of the binomials that we retrieved. We're only going to work with the top 30. So I would ask you to highlight and then copy and paste the top 30 binomials, starting with men and women and finishing with goods and services. Yeah. Okay, so copy and paste those to a new sheet. And this is actually where our analytical work begins. So you see that I labeled this column C here inverse token frequency. So what I want us to do is to fill this column with frequency values of the inverse order of the binomial that we see in column A. So here we have men and women, which occurs 189 times. In this column, I want us to have the frequency of how often in the same corpus we find women and men. Yeah, here we have salt and pepper. Do we have any instances of pepper and salt? Uh, what about day and night? Do we find night and day? Uh, boys and girls, name and address, and so on and so forth. So for all 30 combinations, we need the frequencies of the inverse order. Okay, now I would like you to think about uh, ways in which you could obtain these frequencies. Yeah, there are different ways of doing this that require different amounts of uh, legwork, different things that you need to do. And uh, just take two minutes and think about this and come back to this video later. Think of the ups and downs, the, the downsides and uh, advantages of any individual method. Okay, I'm going to continue now. There are basically three possibilities. The first and easiest possibility would be to look for the inverse combinations in our database. Remember we already extracted all binomials from the corpus data so we could simply take our pivot table and scroll down until we find women and men or order and law or development and research. The frequencies are all there you now and so all we need to do is look them up. Now there are certain problems associated with that. For one thing, it requires an insane amount of scrolling. So there's a huge possibility that we'll just make little mistakes. And also, 
<clears throat> uh, some combinations are not going to be there necessarily, so we're going to look back and forth and waste time. And um, this approach doesn't scale up. It works well with 30 combinations, but uh, if you do that with 3,000 combinations, which, you know, some corpus analyses, they are large, uh, it's just not practical. Okay, so always keep in mind when you're doing something, is this practical to do also with larger amounts of data? The second possibility would be to conduct 30 manual searches in AntConc. So you just type in all the different uh, combinations, women and men, order and law, development and research, and you get uh, frequency counts. That's possible. Uh, it's probably more accurate and faster than possibility number one, but still, it doesn't scale up. It doesn't allow you to do hundreds and hundreds of combinations at the same time, which is what uh, option number three allows you to do. So if you, conduct, if you conduct an advanced search in AntConc with a list of combinations, <clears throat> then you can actually get the results in one fell swoop. So what we need to do in order to go with possibility three is that we need to inverse the combinations, we need to copy and paste them into AntConc's advanced search, and then we need to make a pivot table of the results that we get there. Okay, so let me walk you through these steps of possibility number three. <clears throat> the first thing that we need to do is to do some work in Excel where we reverse the order of the binomials in column A. So as a first step, I want you to copy and paste column A. So I just pasted it into column D. And we need to replace everything except the second noun. So we want to delete men and so that just women um, stays in this cell here. Uh, you're quite familiar with uh, search and replace by now in Excel. So the way to do it is to have a question mark followed by a star and then the tag for the conjunction and the conjunction itself and a little white space that you don't see here, but that's very important to put, okay? Right, so if you do that and replace by nothing, then you get this uh, cell with only the second noun, which I would ask you to label noun two, yeah? All right, uh, so that's the first step. You can probably guess the next couple of steps. So the next easy step would be just to create a column for the conjunction. So label that and, and then just type in uh, the tag, smaller than W, white space, uh, C, J, C, uh, larger than, and then and, okay? And uh, just drag that cell down so that you have all the cells filled with the same entry. And after that, we proceed with the second noun of the inverse combination. So we copy and paste the binomial column once more into column F. And this time we need to replace everything except the first noun so that only men uh, remains in the cell here. The way to do it, again, with uh, search and replace is that you start with a white space, yeah? And then you have the tag for the conjunction. And after that, question mark star, that should enable you to zap everything um, starting with the white space after the first noun. So uh, what you should have once you're done with this step is uh, a display like this where we have women and men, women and policemen, order and law, development and research and so on and so forth in separate columns. Now, if you're thinking, great, now I can highlight everything that's here and copy and paste that straight into Ancong's advanced search window, well, you're thinking the right thing in principle, except Ancong is going to interpret the boundaries between cells as tab stops and it won't find anything. So there's still one more thing, one more Excel trick that we need to uh, perform here so that we can have input for the advanced search in AntConc. And that would be that we uh, combine 
these three columns in a fourth one, yeah, where we say this cell here equals D2, and then this sign here, which is called the ampersand, um, and then a white space, so that means a white space between two double quotation marks, another ampersand, E2, ampersand, another white space, another ampersand, and F2. So essentially what this does, it pastes these three columns together, and instead of tabs between them, we now have white spaces, which is exactly what we need for the advanced search in AntConc. Okay, so once you're here, <clears throat> you uh, can click on advanced search in AntConc, and uh, you can highlight and copy all the inverse combinations and paste them into the AntConc advanced search window. So you need to activate this little checkbox here, use search terms from list below, you need to click apply, and after that, um, the window closes and you can just hit start. Now, if everything has gone according to plan, you should see a display like this with 310 hits, don't worry, yeah, or few, but uh, this is what we searched for and uh, that's exactly what we wanted. We see children and parents, death and life, energy and time, friends and family. And from here on, you basically know how to proceed, yeah? Save the concordance, copy and paste it into Excel, make a pivot table, let me walk you through the steps. So we copy and paste everything into Excel, should look a little something like this. I've made little headers for inverse binomial. Um, and then I made a pivot table and that gives you a result that looks like this with 22 combinations that are attested in the British National Corpus. Now, of course, we started with 30 combinations. Why do we have only 22? Well, it means that eight of our 30 aren't actually attested in the BNC. So for example, law and order, okay? Law and order exists in that order, but there are no examples of order and law. So we'll have to make sure that when we try to align the inverse binomial frequencies with the uh, straightforward binomial frequencies, we have to make sure that all the little ducks are aligned in the right way. Okay, so let's try and do that. <clears throat> So here I pasted the inverse binomials with their token frequencies into the sheet where we created the inverse combinations just a minute ago. Yeah, So you recognize this uh, part here, women and men in separate columns, women and men as one inverse combination. And here we now have our token frequencies that we collected with the help of AntConc. The challenge now is to align uh, these binomials with these binomials. So, how do we do that? <clears throat> the first step would be to sort the inverse binomials alphabetically. So, do me a favor and highlight these two columns here and then sort them. So, under data, there's an option called sort and that will bring up a table, um, a screen that looks like this where you can choose to sort by a certain column. Be sure to activate this checkbox here with the uh, headers uh, in case it's not already activated and sort after um, inverse binomial. Okay, so that will give you a, uh, an alphabetical sorting of these inverse binomials. And then we do the same for all the other columns. Okay, so column A through G, we need to highlight and we need to sort them after the inverse combination so that we have something that lines up almost, okay? So we still need to do a couple of things with it, but we're at least in a position where we can handle the data. So this is what things should look like if everything has gone according to plan. We have the inverse combinations in column G, starting with address and name, death and life, development and research, effort and time. And in the inverse binomial column, we have death and life, energy and time, gas and oil, money and time, and so on and so forth. The last one is women and men, 
uh, here we have women and policemen. But you see that basically uh, we're on a good way. So how we're going to get these uh, two columns aligned? Basically, there's a little uh, manual copy and paste work ahead of us. So what I would like you to do is uh, check line by line. So address and name, that doesn't correspond. So we push everything down one line here. Okay, you can do that with uh, highlighting copy and pasting. So then we have death and life hopefully aligning here in the second line. Again, development and research. Um, there is no development and research in the inverse binomial. So again, you push everything down a line and you keep doing that until you have women and men in the penultimate line and women and policemen then doesn't have anything to correspond with and stays empty. Okay. Once you have done that, all the empty token frequency cells should get a zero and you enter those manually. Now, if everything has gone according to plan, you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Okay, I'm saying a little bit because I sorted my data after the uh, token frequency of the straightforward binomials. So I have uh, women and men on top because men and women is the most frequent combination and I have goods and services down here because well that's the least frequent one in the straightforward binomials. Um, if, you, if your order is different uh, doesn't matter that's fine uh, as long as you have uh, some cells that are filled yeah, and corresponding token frequencies and some cells that are empty with corresponding zeros. Yeah? If you have that everything is fine and we're now going to copy and paste these token frequencies into uh, the column that we initially reserved for them yeah the inverse token frequencies so what you should have are the token frequencies of um, the straightforward order and the inverse order side by side okay so 189 tokens for men and women and 22 for women and men. Right. Okay, what I want us to do now is to calculate a factor of fixedness that tells us for any given word combination how much variability is there between the straightforward order and the inverse order. Yeah. So just to take an example, uh, research and development has 100% of its cases in the straightforward column and 0% in the inverse order. Now, with husband and wife, well, most examples are in the straightforward column, but we have one example that goes the other way. So here we have a ratio of 96% straightforward. That is what this column expresses. And the way to calculate it is that, well, first of all, we need to create the column here. So you insert a column in uh, at position D, and you call that column fixedness, and then uh, you write a basic formula in Excel starting with the equal sign and then open brackets 100, that's the percentage, divided by in brackets B2 plus C2. Yeah? So we take the grand total of uh, the straightforward and the inverse token frequency, close brackets, and we multiply that by the token frequency of the straightforward order. So the number here expresses the percentage of straightforward examples. Right, so uh, once you have that, we can actually sort after fixedness and we see on top all of the examples that are 100% straightforward. And as we go further down, we see combinations with more variability in them. Okay, so the one example with the most equal distribution, if you like, would be radio and television. We have uh, 22 examples for radio and television, and we have 18 for television and radio. So what we have now is an expression of speakers' preferences. For research and development and for time and effort, they clearly prefer 
the straightforward order. And for things like space and time, animals and plants, radio and television, they're not so sure. You know, they're more open, they're more flexible. So really what we want to investigate and what we want to explain here is why do we have certain combinations up here and why are other combinations down there? And the factors that I asked you to think about in the beginning of this video, they hold some key to the answer there. So the first factor that I want us to investigate is the frequency of the first noun and the frequency of the second noun. And specifically the question, is the first noun always more frequent than the second noun? Right, so I want you to do a little exercise here uh, that I think you can do on your own by now. I want you to determine the corpus frequencies of all elements in the column that holds the first noun. Okay, we determined those first nouns, we isolated them, so it should be easy to search them in Ancong. I want you to do that. I also want you to determine the corpus frequencies of all elements in the column that is called noun two. And I want you to test for all 30 binomials whether noun 1 is more frequent than noun 2. So basically we're testing whether frequency has a strong effect on speaker's preferences for the straightforward binomial order. I want you to make a new column in the spreadsheet that you call uh, frec n1 is larger than n2. And I want you to have values in this column. Yes, if the first noun is more frequent than noun two. And no, if the frequency of noun one is actually smaller than the frequency of the noun uh, that is noun two. I hope you got this to work. On this slide, you see a version of the spreadsheet in which I included a column that says frequency of n1 is larger than the frequency of noun 2. And you see that we have a couple of yeses and a couple of noes. And the noes actually include some of the combinations that have a 100% rate for the straightforward order. So for example, research and development. Uh, development is more frequent than research. Uh, policemen and women, yeah, so women are more frequent than policemen. And uh, republics and provinces. <laughs> uh, so provinces are actually more frequent, yeah. So 159 provinces, 127 republics. So it appears from these data that frequency may have some effect but it clearly doesn't explain everything. So we need to look at further factors, which is what we're going to do now. The next variable that I want us to look at is the number of syllables in the first noun and in the second noun. And luckily for this, we don't need ANCONG. We can just look at the noun and determine how many syllables are in that noun. And I want you to do that for yourself. So determine the number of syllables of all elements for noun one. Uh, do the same for all nouns in the column noun 2. And then for all 30 binomials, test whether noun 1 has fewer syllables than noun 2. And once you've done that, make a new column that you call syllable noun 1 smaller than noun 2. And you add values yes if the first element is shorter than the second one, and no if the first element is actually longer than the second one. Here you see a version of the spreadsheet where I did that. So I put my column right next to the frequency column. And uh, we see that for the first couple of entries, research and development, time and effort, law and order, name and address, salt and pepper, actually the length factor is obeyed by all the combinations. Now, also here we have a couple of no's. Yeah? So for instance, uh, policemen and women. Yeah. Uh, republics and provinces, they have equal length, so I couldn't put a yes. Life and death, so basically all combinations that consist of single syllable words, there the first one isn't shorter than the second one. We could maybe think of this variable differently and say the first one shouldn't be longer than the second one. Okay, in that case, life and death would be obeying that variable, 
Yeah, but the way we set it up was we said no n1 needs to be shorter than n2 and so it gets a no here. Let's continue with the third factor that you probably didn't think of in this way. Now in linguistics there is a notion that is called marketness that you are maybe familiar with. Marketness allows linguists to distinguish between something that is ordinary, normal, the default case, and whatever deviates from that is called the marked case. Right? So this, if you like, is a variable that catches several distinctions, like for instance singular versus plural. In many languages the singular is unmarked, quite literally, and plural has a special marking to it. Same with positive and negative. Okay? A positive sentence would be, I read a book. The negative requires extra marking. I don't read the book. Um, now, less marked and more marked can be applied to a great range of distinctions like animate and inanimate, right and left, positive and negative, concrete and abstract, front and back, more important and less important, male and female. Yeah, so um, why is female the marked case? Well, think of waiter and waitress, yeah? lion, lioness. So there is some linguistic ground for saying that female is the marked case if you needed any argument for that. Um, big and small, close and far, now and later. I think you get the point that we can distinguish all of these notions in terms of one thing that is the norm and another thing that is the marked case. Now, in terms of annotating marketness, I want you to go through all 30 binomials and I want you to check for each one whether the first noun can be seen as less marked than the second one. If we take, for example, a combination like food and beverages, yeah, food, the first one is in the singular, beverages, the second one is in the plural, so that would conform to the tendency that the first item is less marked than the second one. If we have something like boys and girls, we have male first and female second, and also that would conform to uh, the tendency that the first item is less marked than the second one. Okay, please do me a favor and uh, make your coding decisions now, and then add a column that you call mark n1 smaller than n2. I'm going to show you my coding decisions now. So for research and development, I said yes, this conforms to the marketness constraint because of um, a kind of iconicity of sequence. We have to do research now so that we can have development later. Yeah? You may have come to a different decision, but that's how I motivated my decision there. Time and effort, uh, here I said no. Yeah? Time is more abstract, hard to describe, hard to understand. Effort is something much more concrete. So uh, I would say time and effort violates, uh, where do we have it, abstract and concrete. So we would expect the more concrete item first and the abstract item later. So it should be effort and time and not time and effort. Um, right, but on the whole, you see that I have a whole lot of yeses here in this column. Uh, so, for example, space and time, there we have the more concrete stuff first and the more abstract item second. Right, now for the million dollar question, which is the most important factor? Is corpus frequency the most important one? Is phonological length the most important one? Is marketness the most important one? Well, there are different ways of finding that out and I can't really say which one is the best way. We're going to do something relatively simple here, so proceed with caution. Um, what I would like you to do is to take all the data that we have right now and sort the columns after the frequency factor that we created, okay? So um, sort after frequency n1 is larger than n2. Um, <clears throat> and let's have the yes answers first and the no answers second. So once we have that, we uh, have all the yeses here and all the noes here, and we can uh, simply add up 
the ratios that we have, ideally we would end up with a very large value and explain everything. Okay, so if I highlight all of these cells here, I get a value of 1475.94. So these in a way are our successes. This is where the combinations conform to a large extent to uh, this factor. And uh, all the remaining cases are the ones that we have to pit against the yeses. So we have about 1,500 yes and 1,124 points for no. Right. Um, we do the same kind of uh, sorting and adding up for the second factor, the one with the syllables. And here we have a smaller amount of yeses, okay? And we add up all those numbers for yeses and get uh, 1,286 for yes and actually a larger number for no, 1,313 um, points for no. And you guessed it, we also have to do the same for the marketness column. And here, of course, I have a large number of yeses, and unsurprisingly, we get a high value for uh, combinations that conform to the marketness factor. So according to this very coarse-grained ranking, syllables have the least impact, frequency has an impact that is slightly larger, and the most important factor would be marketness. So a semantic factor rather than one that has to do with language form or with usage frequency. Of course, in order to say more about this, we would have to substantiate this hypothesis. We'd have to test whether this ranking really holds up when we confront it with more empirical data. And that's what I want to talk about in the last couple of minutes of this video here. So how can we test this ranking? Obviously, we would need some kind of empirical data to confront it with. So we would retrieve new corpus data, a new set of binomials, and then we would see whether our factors actually predict the right order. So we would get a concordance and we would annotate each example, so each individual token for the three factors. Yeah? Is the length factor observed? Is the first one shorter than the second one? Is the frequency factor observed? Is the first one more frequent than the second one? And is marketness observed? Is the first one less marked than the second one? And then we check whether these factors are actually observed or not and in what order. Okay, so if all three factors are in agreement, then the answer is easy. We give the example a yes, our model is essentially correct here. But where it gets interesting, of course, is when there's disagreement between the uh, three factors. So according to our model, marketness and frequency are more powerful than uh, syllables. So if frequency and marketness give us a yes, then uh, we mark the example as correct even though the length requirement might not be observed. Um, if only marketness gives us a yes and frequency says no and length says no, then we still get a correct example, right? So our model predicts that marketness is the strongest factor. So if marketness obtains, it trumps everything else. However, in all other cases, we mark the example that we found as wrong. Or it's not the example that is wrong, it's just that our model predicted a different order. Yeah? So for example, <clears throat> uh, marketness doesn't work, but frequency and syllables are just in the way that we would predict. So uh, shorter word first, more frequent word first. If marketness is not right, then we still have to mark the example as wrong. If we do this, we will end up with a ratio of correct and wrong examples, and hopefully we'll get many examples right. Now, the interesting part comes when we compare our ranking to other rankings. So does this ranking of factors, uh, syllables, frequencies, and marketers as the most important ones, does that yield more correct examples 
then rankings where we say frequency is the most powerful factor followed by marketness and then syllables or other rankings where the number of syllables is actually the most important factor followed by frequency and marketness only plays a minor role yeah you see the logic of this depending on how you rank the factors you might get higher or lower numbers of correctly predicted examples and that is what actual studies of binomials are doing with uh, somewhat more sophisticated methods than we've been using in this video. So if you're really curious to find out more about why speakers choose a given order when they use a binomial expression, do yourself a favor, have a closer look at these studies here. Uh, Sandra Molin, The Irreversibility of English Binomials, and a classic paper by Banner and Levy, The Chicken or the Egg, A Probabilistic Analysis of English Binomials. I can really recommend them, yeah? And now you're in a position to really understand what is going on, how the factors were analyzed, and what results the authors got in the end. Okay, that's it for now. Have a good week, and I hope to see you soon. Bye.